Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Environmental Defense Fund's inaugural webinar on the Business Policy Nexus. We're focusing today on the EPA's Clean Power Plan. But before we get underway, uh, I'd like to offer a little housekeeping. First of all, this webinar is being recorded uh, for later viewing and sharing, and it'll be available online no later than Monday at business.edf.org slash webinar. Also, uh, if you have any questions to submit for Tom or Mandy, please submit them via the chat window. And if you haven't already dialed in, the phone, the phone number for the webinar is up on the screen if for some reason you can't uh, hear this through your computer. And with that, I'd like to introduce today's presenters. Uh, joining us for today's webinar are Tom Murray, EDF's Vice President of Corporate Partnerships, and Mandy Warner, a Senior Manager in EDF's U.S. Climate and Air Program. Tom will lead today's discussion about the Clean Power Plan. Tom, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Stephen, and good afternoon, everyone. It's great to have so many of you on the line with us today. As Stephen mentioned, I'm Tom Murray, Vice President of Corporate Partnerships at EDF. It's hard to believe, but we're approaching the 25-year anniversary of our first corporate partnership with McDonald's. As a result, we think it's a good time to reflect on our work to date and also to look ahead to the new challenges and opportunities that lie in front of us. Over the last 25 years, EDF has worked with leading businesses like McDonald's, FedEx, Walmart, KKR, and others to find solutions that align sustainability and business. Together, we have kicked off market transformations in fast food, shipping, retail, private equity, and commercial building energy efficiency. We've made a lot of progress, but there's new challenges and more hard work ahead of us. And moving from the progress we've made today to full-scale solutions to environmental problems tomorrow is going to require a big next step in corporate environmental leadership. For companies, we think this means aligning their internal corporate sustainability strategy and operations with their external engagement in public policy. We call this the business policy nexus, and it's something that we've been writing about recently on our EDF business blog. <clears throat> As we look ahead at recent, uh, at upcoming rulemakings and shifts in public opinion, we believe that business have some new opportunities, new opportunities to be vocal leaders on a number of important energy and environmental issues, and that business has a lot to benefit from in the process. In particular, companies who care about clean energy have some near-term opportunities to help accelerate demand and supply for renewable energy and energy efficiency. Some companies, in fact, are already stepping up to lead on this issue. In just the last few months, we've seen three examples of strong business support of clean energy alternatives. First, Earlier this year, we saw 19 companies, 19 companies that included Bloomberg, Facebook, General Motors, Novo Nordisk, Volvo, and Walmart, work with the World Wildlife Fund and the World Resources Institute to create the new Renewable Energy Buyers Principles. The goal was to communicate their needs to the market and to set a combined renewable energy target of 10 megawatt hours each year. Second, just recently, we saw a group of investors managing over $300 billion in assets, $300 billion in assets calling for federal regulations to reduce methane emissions from natural gas as an important step in reducing both environmental and financial risk. And finally, since June, we've seen growing momentum and over 200 companies publicly voiced their support for EPA's proposed Clean Power Plan. Now, the Clean Power Plan is our topic for today. And this morning, I saw some new research just released from Yale University that shows that 67% of Americans support reducing emissions from existing power plants. The implementation of the Clean Power Plan has the potential to do this, to secure significant reductions in carbon pollution and companies like yours, companies like the ones on the phone today, have a major opportunity to help shape policy 
and ways that can help you meet your sustainability and your greenhouse gas goals by increasing access to competitive clean energy and increased tools and incentives for better energy management. So to help me uh, explain this opportunity and dig in on the clean, out, uh, clean Power Plan, let me introduce my colleague, Mandy Warner. Mandy is a senior manager in EDF's U.S. Climate and Air Program. She works on legislative and regulatory issues related to the power sector and is working to secure the Clean Power Plan. Welcome, Mandy. To help us get started with this conversation, Mandy, can you tell us a little bit about the Clean Power Plan in particular, what is, what is it and why is it so important? Yeah, well, thank you, Tom, so much for uh, having me here today, and thank you to all of you on the phone for participating. I'm going to provide a, a pretty high-level overview of the Clean Power Plan. Um, so the Clean Power Plan is a key part of President Obama's Climate Action Plan, which he announced in July of 2013. Um, it's incredibly important because currently there are no national-level limits on carbon pollution from existing fossil fuel-fired power plants, which are responsible for about 40% of U.S. carbon emissions. So what the Clean Power Plan does is create this, these first-ever national limits on carbon from existing power plants. And it does this by setting state-by-state -state emission guidelines that are specifically tailored to each state's in emission reduction opportunities. The Environmental Protection Agency announced these standards earlier this year, June 2nd of 2014, using their existing authority under the Clean Air Act uh, called Section 111D. You may have also heard these referred to as carbon pollution standards for existing power plants. Uh, overall, this plan is expected to achieve a 30% carbon emission reduction from the U.S. power sector by 2030. Um, EPA is also projecting some incredibly significant and exciting climate and health benefits uh, monetized at 55 to 93 billion in 2030. So it's really a significant step forward, Tom. Thanks, Mandy. Well, it's clear that there's big environmental and economic uh, benefits associated with this, and most of the participants on today's webinar are private sector energy users. So it'd be great if you could tell us a little bit about how you think the Clean Power Plan impacts business. I mean, what does it mean for the businesses on the phone today? Sure. So we see this as a really unique opportunity for businesses to influence the clean energy and efficiency op options in the states where they're operating. And there's a lot at stake. Um, three points I'd make that I think are important for businesses of all stripes to bear in mind are, one, this program as it's currently proposed runs from 2020 to 2030. So there are decisions that are being made in the next several years at the state and multi-state level that will shape the pollution produced by energy generation for the next decade and a half. Uh, furthermore, as many folks are probably aware, the power sector is in a really unique moment of significant reinvestment to upgrade the grid and replace aging generation. The average age of U.S. coal plants, for example, is about 40 years. So this, in combination with some market dynamics like lower cost natural gas and renewables, has been driving an enormous amount of change in the power sector. And the decisions that are being made now with those reinvestments and in the coming years will matter a lot in the near and long term. So it's, again, a really important opportunity for businesses to chime in to help ensure that we're locking in the most prudent, cost-effective, and low-carbon investments now. And the second overall point for you know, why this matters to business is that States under the Clean Power Plan have an enormous amount of flexibility in how they can craft their plan. So, for example, some states will be looking at additional or expanded energy efficiency and renewable energy programs. They could look at how to structure incentives, you know, including potentially through market-based trading measures to ensure that emissions are reduced as cost-effectively as possible. Uh, states could be looking at putting in, uh, putting in place emission standards for power plants or adopting financing structures to drive development of resources like efficiency and renewables. You know, the third overarching point I'd make are some specifics about what, all, what the Clean Power Plan could also offer. You know, one, it, things like energy efficiency we know can help protect consumers from fossil fuel price volatility, and this is something that we see increasingly associated with fossil fuels. So second, uh, this is also really an opportunity to make the grid more resilient to some of the effects of climate change, such as water shortages. Um, as you know, renewables and efficiency don't require extra water. Um, you know, third, the Clean Power Plan can offer improved market certainty, which is important for the power sector and, and again, businesses of all stripes, which can help smooth out electricity prices. You know, fourth, uh, increasing demand-side energy efficiency opportunities can save consumers of all types money. 
uh, fifth and last, uh, expanding markets for companies in the energy efficiency and renewable energy sectors, as well as those that feed into their supply chain is another potential benefit of the clean power plan. Well, hearing all that, I, I'd say a key takeaway is that this is really important to everybody, not just, not just utilities. Um, this really has the potential to impact any sustainability, any energy officer at a company who's tried to price green power on the market or build the business case for an energy efficiency program. Am I right about that? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Tom. And as most of us know, the incentives for energy efficiency and renewable sources aren't necessarily a sure thing, particularly in today's fiscal and political environment. So businesses that are interested in pursuing those types of resources and you know, ensuring reliable, consistently priced power and making the best business case for them have a really strong, great opportunity to make their voices heard in this process. Okay, that's terrific. Well, now that we know a little bit more about what it is and how important the Clean Power Plan is for both the environment and for business, let's talk a little bit about how it's going to work. Can you tell us, can you tell us about that? Sure. So uh, on your screen right now, um, if, if you're plugged in, you should see uh, a four-step process of the Clean Power Plan pathway. I'm going to quickly go through um, you know, what, the, what the approach here is. So first, EPA is setting emission reduction targets for the states based on their energy generation infrastructure and available resources. And they're doing this using what's been called the four building blocks. Now, the first building block is um, finding opportunities for efficiency improvements at existing coal-fired power plants. The second building block is shifting generation away from the highest emitting plants and towards lower emitting generation resources. The third building block is increasing the deployment of renewable energy. And the fourth building block is harvesting demand-side energy efficiency. So once EPA um, you know, has set these emission reduction targets for states under the, you know, the first section of, um, of this four-step process, what happens next is the state is going to develop their own respective implementation plans or working with other states develop multi-state plans or bilateral agreements to meet those emission targets. And there's an enormous amount of flexibility in how the state or states can go about meeting their targets. Um, states have to meet an emission rate average over the 10 years between 2020 and 2029, and states can sign the framework of their plan, their glide path to reach that average rate over the 10-year period, and how to actually allocate emission reduction responsibilities within the state. Um, this plan development process is very similar to what states have been doing under other programs under the Clean Air Act, including um, national standards on ozone, particulate matter, and lead, for example. So it's a familiar process for states. Uh, the third step of the Clean Power Plan pathway and process is that EPA uh, reviews the state plans to ensure that they're going to meet the established target. And once a plan is approved, the, the last step is that states begin implementation. Well, great. And given that states have to implement the plan from 2020 to 2030, can you walk us through a little bit more about the timeline for, for the Clean Power Plan? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so on your screen now, you should have a, another timeline that um, breaks down you know, what has happened on these standards and what we're expecting based on how it's currently proposed. So um, as I uh, mentioned uh, earlier, these standards were proposed by EPA June 2nd of this year. Um, there were some public hearings in the summer uh, about the proposal, and the current public comment period is, is scheduled to close December 1st of this year, so it's still an open comment process. Um, once, uh, once the comment period closes, EPA is going to begin reviewing all the comments, and we're expecting the final uh, standards for existing power plants to come out in June of next year. Um, once that happens, the next step is for states to start developing their plans. And so the state implementation plans are due in 2016. Uh, for the most part, states can request some additional time, and those states that are working on multi-state agreements will also get more time. And then, and then, of course, sorry, at the end is uh, in 2020, power companies will start securing the reductions that are uh, identified in their plans. Great. So if we think about how this is going to impact companies, uh, you know, first under the Clean Power Plan, power companies will be looking for ways to meet their goals, likely through some combination of uh, adopting lower carbon sources, uh, maybe by shifting to renewables or from shifting from coal to natural gas but also by offering more incentives for energy efficiency. 
Um, obviously, for companies in sectors like energy efficiency, renewable energy, demand response, and things like that, the Clean Power Plan will provide some clear growth opportunities for those kind of businesses. But I think what we're also hearing today is that this is a really big opportunity for energy users as well. That clean power, demand response, increased incentives for energy efficiency are, are all areas that can help any company meet their business and sustainability goals. Um, and that these are the areas where power users, where companies that are big users of power have a unique opportunity to influence the way that state plans are shaped and how they're being developed. Um, so it does feel like there's this unique opportunity for companies to weigh in and be part of how the implementation plan process plays out. Um, can you, let's talk about that. You know, what, what can companies be doing to make sure that their ideas and their, their voices are heard as part of that process? Yeah, so companies um, have a, an opportunity to engage with uh, state officials, power companies, and other stakeholders to shape the, the implementation plans in the states where they're operating. So specific avenues of engagement are going to vary a lot uh, state to state, um, but you know, I can provide an overview of some of the general ways you can get involved in this process. So for example, a company could, you know, one, take part in stakeholder groups. Um, there have been a lot of stakeholder groups around the Clean Power Plan and the uh, carbon pollution standards for, for months or years in some cases. Um, many state departments of environment or natural resources have convened these types of meetings in the past. Um, second, a company could offer public comments to decision makers that are working on the state plan development. Uh, third, a company could uh, weigh in with the, the state energy regulators that are overseeing energy planning decisions. Uh, and last, uh, companies could, could decide to weigh in with their state legislators and members of Congress um, by you know, sharing your energy efficiency or renewable energy stories or advocating for specific policies and programs as a part of this. Terrific. Um, well, thanks, Mandy, for your help walking us through all of that. That was certainly a lot of great information and, and insight into the Clean Power Plan. Um, I think at this point we should open the floor up to questions. I know that we've already had a few come in, um, and, and we'll take a look at those. I think, I think first what I'm seeing, the first question I'm seeing is that um, kind of building on what we were just talking about, that given that, that this is mostly about regulating energy producers, um, what influence do other types of companies have uh, in this process? How can, you know, how can they impact it? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so as we all know, energy affects every part of the economy, and policymakers are really keen to understand how all companies in their states are thinking about not only their energy needs, uh, but also their goals and needs around access to renewables and energy efficiency. So um, as I alluded to earlier, for the past months and years, there's been a lot of conversations about carbon standards, and there's been um, many stakeholders already at the table thinking through some of these issues, including you know, power companies, operators of coal plants, labor, uh, NGOs like EDF, and many, many others. So we think state agencies, elected officials, and others would really be excited to hear from businesses across sectors about the importance of addressing climate change and of having access to things like energy efficiency and renewables. Great, thanks Mandy. And we've had a couple questions come in, but I want to encourage folks to continue to use the chat function on the lower left-hand part of your screen to, to, keep, to keep those questions coming. Um, a couple questions related to how, uh, if we can be more specific about what company engagement might look like. So how could a particular company engage if they were interested in weighing in on the Clean Power Plan? Um, sure. So let's uh, assume we have a company, say, you know, operating or, or headquartered in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, this company could attend a, a stakeholder meeting hosted by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, uh, who has, in fact, has hosted several meetings this past summer on the Carbon Pollution Standards, the Clean Power Plan. Um, this company could share its stories about the benefits of energy efficiency as they see it, what their goals around renewable energy uh, purchasing are, for example. Um, this company could also engage in meetings with the state policymakers directly and our energy provider. In terms of longer term opportunities, public hearings on the state plans once they're drafted. Um, as part of the Clean Air Act, every state is required to have a public hearing on a substantial draft of their plan prior to submitting it to EPA. Uh, you know, so this timing is going to be determined on a, a state by state basis, but it will be after the rule is finalized in June 2015. So on these hearings, what a business could do is attend the hearing and offer testimony, 
um, again, sharing their stories about efficiency and renewables. Um, a company could do an op-ed or a letter to the editor around the time of the hearing to share those perspectives. And again, there's um, numerous opportunities to have one-on-one -on -one engagements with the State Public Utilities Commission or Department of Environment and Governor's Office. So Mandy, a, a kind of a related question. Um, you mentioned a Minnesota example and the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Um, one of our listeners is interested in knowing how you find out what state agency or department leads in your state. Is there a resource they can go to or? Yeah, they, they can ask us. We'll be happy to help navigate those, um, those processes in the state because it does vary state to state. It, in most places it's the, whatever the State Department of Environment or Natural Resources is. But if you have a specific question about the state, we can um, you know, circle back with you afterwards to, to give you that information. Okay, great. <clears throat> That's terrific. Um, a couple other questions related to, to a, a, a theme of utility prices and re, uh, reliability. So I think folks are interested in hearing our perspective on, um, on what we think the Clean Power Plan might mean for, for utility prices and, and electricity reliability. I know that's an important concern for many companies. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. And um, EPA has modeled this in, in their proposal and in the technical documents. And they're projecting that average electricity bills are actually going to be 8% lower in 2030 under the Clean Power Plan scenario compared to business as usual. And this is largely due to reduced demand and expanded efficiency. And um, for many of the companies on the phone, I'm sure know that our decades of experience with energy efficiency has really proven out that those types of investments can reduce emissions and electric bills. Um, we also have the dynamic going on with the really dramatically plummeting cost of renewable energy in recent years that's made it an increasingly attractive and competitive option for generating power. Um, on reliability, this has been a, a huge subject as it always is with every clean air standard. Um, so I'd offer a couple of, of thoughts here. So first and foremost, you know, the power sector has an enormous amount of experience implementing clean air standards, many on shorter time frames than what we have with the clean power plan. And they've ensured reliable power while reducing emissions and you know, haven't turned the lights off because of clean air standards. Um, a second point is, uh, you know, about the Clean Air power, power Plan specifically, it requires states to meet an emission rate average over a 10-year time frame. So this inherently gives states a great deal of flexibility in how they can design their plans. And a third point that's somewhat related to the second is that you know, compliance with the Clean Power Plan and impacts on generation resources are going to be determined by the state implementation plans. So states and utility regular, regulators are going to continue working with their grid operators and power companies to ensure that state plans protect reliability, as they've always done with implementing clean air standards and anything, any other changes. And there's the opportunity, again, to take full advantage of the timeline flexibility offered in the Clean Power Plan. Great. Thanks, Mandy. Um, <clears throat> as we work through a couple additional questions, I just want to remind folks to keep sending them in using the, using the chat function in the, uh, on their screen. Um, I think the next thing that a couple people are interested in hearing about is, um, and I mentioned uh, as part of the kickoff to the call, the new Yale research that came out today about public uh, support for reducing emissions from existing power plants. Um, I, th I think this is driven by uh, wanting to know more about what's out there in terms of public support or maybe how company customers feel about uh, about the clean power plan or about addressing uh, emissions from power plants. Yeah, so uh, I mean you mentioned at the, at the top of the call the, the new Yale polling that came out and polls have consistently shown incredibly strong support among the public for standards uh, limiting carbon pollution from existing power plants. Um, there was also a, a, poll, a poll in June from the Washington Post and ABC that showed pretty consistent numbers that about 70% of respondents were in support of the federal government limiting greenhouse gases from existing power plants. Um, so we've seen strong support for you know, not only with specific standards, but action on climate change in general. Great. That's helpful. Um, I think the uh, next question that we've got in um, is, is a question about how, how the uh, recent midterm elections have changed the political landscape and how this might affect the implementation of the Clean Power Plan. Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, first off, I would be remiss not to mention the really huge announcement last week of an agreement between China and the U.S. on carbon. 
there are um, really significant, these are both really significant steps by co these countries to address climate change on a global sc scale and send an enormous market signal. Um, in terms of the more domestic political landscape, you know, the big change from the election is that you know, Republicans won control of the Senate, which means they're going to control both uh, houses of Congress for at least the next two years, and this could have an impact on the country's environmental and all policies. Um, you know, what hasn't changed, again, as ties into the previous question, is that there is really strong support for the environment and oh, consistently high polling for the clean power plant itself. Um, you know, we anticipate there will be legislative conversations and actions about EPA and the clean power plan, and uh, almost certainly next year, and EDF and others will be engaged. Okay, one additional question that just came in. Um, you know, obviously there's still a lot to, to transpire here with the clean power plan and how state implementation plans will be developed. Um, Amanda, do we have a sense of, um, of how early action will be incorporated into this? What, what impact will be for companies that have already made a great deal of progress on, on energy efficiency? Yeah, so this has been a, a really um, important topic of conversation that's come up in the last couple of months since the proposal uh, came out in June, and there's been an enormous amount of interest uh, about this issue. Um, so as the Clean Power Plan is currently structured, states and companies that have already transitioned to low carbon or, or zero emitting resources are closer to, uh, you know, full deployment of BSE, uh, I'm sorry, the best system of emission reduction um, as it's proposed under the Clean Power Plan. Um, and yeah, for the period from, um, you know, 2012 to 2020, you could envision there could be scenarios where you could have a bank crediting system set up. Um, but again, this is another reason to be, for all companies, to be engaged and at the table and working with their states and the, the group of states perhaps that are, um, you know, in, engaging in this state plan process. Great. Thank, thanks for that question. Um, I think one, one additional thing that it looks like people are interested in, and we touched on it in terms of uh, helping folks identify the right state agencies to be in touch with, but, you know, what other um, ways are there for EDF to help companies that are either on the phone today or, or, or beyond that are interested in beginning to get more involved in policy advocacy on the Clean Power Plan or, or beyond? Uh, sure. So first, if you're feeling very ambitious and are not going to be um, in your, your post-Thanksgiving haze um, after next week, the comma period on the proposal uh, closes on December 1st, and you know we, we stand at the ready to, to help with any companies that want to think through potentially offering their support and comments on the proposed Clean Power Plan. Um, so that's you know one avenue for engagement that's pretty near term. Um, but also, if you're interested, um, again, just telling your company's stories about the importance of energy efficiency opportunities and access to renewable energy um, and how it supports the need for the Clean Power Plan, um, you know, is, is another avenue for engagement. Um, as, as I think I've mentioned before, EDF, EDF is really happy to help any companies that want to think through engaging at the state or other levels, um, you know, where they're operating or and at whatever comfort level a, a company would have. Um, you know, and lastly, we will, you know, we're, we're here to help figure out which agencies uh, within a state make sense to submit public letters and to, to help, you know, set up meetings and make your views known as the state implementation plans are under development. Terrific. And as we're waiting for any additional questions to come in, I think the other thing we'd point out is that, you know, this, uh, both the Clean Power Plan and the Business Policy Nexus is a new topic that we plan to be spending more time on. Uh, we're talking about actively on our business our EDF business blog, uh, and we'll be following up from this webinar with more information and resources there. So we invite we invite folks to uh, continue to follow this work there, uh, post post comments or questions, um, and we'll do our best to keep the keep you guys up to speed. Um, with that, it looks like um, we have no further questions. So um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today, and I'll I'll turn it over to Stephen to uh, wrap up the call. Thanks, Tom. So just to follow up with everybody, we will be sending out a link um, no later than Monday, but probably before, uh, with a link to the recorded webinar. If you're interested in engaging further with us, please connect with us after the webinar at business at edf.org, and let's discuss what opportunities is, exist in the areas and regions that you operate. And again, please follow us on the EDF business blog, which is business.edf slash blog. Uh, to follow what else is going to be coming up on the business policy nexus and other issues that companies like yours can play a role in. 
thanks very much for joining us, and uh, keep your eyes out, uh, your eyes out for, for good blog posts and for the webinars. Thank you very much. Thank you.